Today's guest is none other than Dustin from Retro Supply Co. I am super excited that Dustin is going to talk to us about his journey of just starting Retro Supply Co. If you've been around in the design or the artistic game for a while, you've probably heard of them. Um, if you haven't, you definitely need to check it out. I'm displaying the website right now so you can look through that. It's also linked down in the description. But everything from Procreate brushes to uh, Photoshop effects to Illustrator plugins, brushes, things like that, everything you need as an artist or a designer, Retro Supply Co. has an amazing style. And I think what would be super beneficial for people to hear is how you kind of started this whole thing. And I remember last time we were talking, you were starting to kind of give your, your personal story, which I thought was so powerful, and I think, helpful for people to hear in just kind of how the arts and design really turned your life around, really, really saved your life, really provided a full income. And I feel like a lot of people struggle with this idea of wanting to start something or invest in something or yeah, just think it's not worth it or that it can't happen. And so I kind of just want you to start by sharing your story and how Retro Supply Co. even existed you know and and just the growth that you've had over the years yeah i'd love to well first drew thanks for having me on um it's been great getting to know you and yeah it's just it's an honor to be on the show um retro supply started gosh it's 11 or 12 years ago mm. i was trying to get a grip on the create on uh being a graphic designer doing freelance i did some side gigs and i ended up working for uh, a blogger that I really loved back then it was like they were literally called bloggers right and they just like called paid to exist my friend Jonathan Mead and um, that was really crucial for me because before that I was really living month to month trying to find graphic design gigs mm. and I started working for Jonathan and I learned a lot about marketing in that 18 months that I worked for him. So what happened was I had a lot of other struggles going on at the same time. I was either a very partying 20 something year old or an alcoholic, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. I was just, I was just drinking a lot. I had gotten mm. been married a couple of years and I was still in that twenties type right. of stage. Yeah. But I was drinking a lot. I was smoking and I'm trying to run these, this, these businesses. And then, and we were in debt mm. and, um, you know, I was still in that stage where I was trying to figure things out. I was definitely frustrated. And then I found out that we were going to have our first child. Oh, and even bigger, even, even bigger bomb there in the middle of all that. <laughs> yeah. Talk about something that, that makes you reevaluate where you're at, because at that point it just was like a, a, a timer started, you mm. know, you have nine, you have nine months to figure this out. Mm, okay. And uh, I had fears, right? My my family is, of course, you know, we're telling them the good news, but I'm worried uh, about looking foolish. I've been trying to to start a variety of businesses. We were living down in the Bay Area and had started a little tiny quote unquote startup. I use that loosely because it was just me and my friend Jonathan, and that wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't making any money, and I just realized that there was no longer time to wait to mess around. And I started getting up really early, like four thirty or five in the morning. And going down to the coffee shop and just working on a little business just to make mm. some extra money. Honestly, I just wanted to make diaper money. I just wanted to have something right. that yeah. was going to make it where I could justify that I was trying my hardest to my family. So I started going down there and working on these products. And at the time, Creative Market had just launched, which is like okay. a marketplace to buy digital right. tools, fonts right. and things like that. I made a goal that every week I would make a product and publish it wow. on Creative Market. And it the bar was much lower back then too. People were just putting, I mean, very established designers, creators were putting fonts up or uh, textures up and then a font on the top that said textures, subtle textures. Coming from a marketing background, I thought if I can make really attractive packaging for this, where it feels like you could walk into a store and grab it and want to buy it, and I could put good copy with it and good explanations mm. and good before and afters and testimonials and all these kind of marketing levers that people use to help to influence people to buy, I thought, that could probably do a lot in this space. And so every week I was making a product and uh, nothing was really happening. And then one morning I'm working and I have my phone notifications on and it starts, you know, beeping, you know, ding, 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 ding. I'm looking, I'm like, what is this? And these are email notifications. Yeah. And I, and I look at my emails and it's creative market notifications letting me know that I'm getting sales. So they had featured me in the newsletter. And I mean, wow. we went from like, I'm getting, you know, a sale a day 
to. I literally packed up my bag, ran home, see my wife and my phone is still ringing with these notifications. And I got That's home incredible. and I just remember like lifting the phone up and being like, each one of these is like $8 in our bank account. And like, remember, like we're in debt, like we're barely getting by, you know, it was a really emotional moment. And um, by the end of the day, we had made over probably around somewhere around $2,000. Yeah. And, wow. Yeah. Which was like more than I had made in uh, a pay period ever in my life. Right. And okay. Yeah. It was huge. It was, I mean, that was a game changer. If that's all it was, that would have changed my life in some ways. Um, yeah. and by the end of the month, I think I'd made seven or $8,000. Um, and then I kind of kept repeating that process and eventually I was getting to 10, $15,000 a month. And by the time my daughter was born nine months later, we paid off our debt. I Dang. had quit smoking, quit drinking, lost 25 pounds, was running, you know, three to five miles a day. It was really, a. Uh, it was magic, man. It was it was a magic time for sure. Yeah, I mean that's a full one eighty turning away from one lifestyle and absolutely doing something different. And I think there's some some definitely some key things to maybe unpack here that helped you with this success and and this growth. The first of which you said for some reason to to get this accomplished, you felt like you had to get up really early. And you're not the first person I've heard that from. I've heard that from other creators that have become extremely successful, they're either getting up extremely early or they're working into very odd numbers of the night mm -hmm. and really refining their craft. So why did you feel like um, you needed to do that versus like a normal kind of like, you know, I'll get up at the normal kind of 7, 730, start my regular day? Was it because you had other, was this something that you were working on prior to your full-time gig or something like that? Or were you just like, man, I'm getting up at 4.30 and I'm I'm going to just crush this all day long. Like what, walk me through the right. process of getting up early to develop this thing. Well, I, I did, I had other commitments. So I had the Jonathan who I had been working for, me and him had decided to start a business together and it was called Playbook and it was essentially marketing playbooks. And okay. I had committed to him that I was going to spend, you know, my best hours during the day working on that. So I wanted to keep my word to him, even though at that point, this was bringing in just enough money to break even. It wasn't really significant money in terms of providing for myself. So I wanted to keep my word to him. And the only way to do that was to get up really early. So if I got to the coffee shop at, you know, 445, 5, I basically had four hours okay. that I could work. And and so that's why I did it. And the, the kind of secondary reason is that I... For me, especially, I feel like uh, energy, there's blocks of energy, like kind of physiologically for me in the day. And one is first thing in the morning, I'm useless at about one o'clock in the afternoon. And I feel like something comes back around like nine or 10 at night. And so I wanted yeah. to also kind of ride the wave of that energy. You were making this goal to put out one product a week. Is that right? So you would formulate, you would create and then post or publish one product per week. And so how long did you keep that up doing this one one product a week on Creative Market? I think I did it for four or five weeks before that kind of okay magic day kind of hit. Okay. So there's at least over a, a month's worth of routine that's happening, the work mm -hmm. that's putting into it, possibly not thinking that this was going to happen. Now, obviously hoping for the best, but what I'm saying is you could have very well just kept doing that and it could have been six or seven or eight or nine or 10 weeks before that happens. But your, your, your goal was I'm going to do a product every week. And so I think this is an important point because what a lot of people think is they're going to craft a product that they think is amazing or craft a design or something that they think is amazing and list it somewhere or post it somewhere. And tomorrow or the next day, they're supposed to be sales. What you're suggesting is that it's at least four or five weeks worth of constant work to be consistent. I think that's the key is consistent. And then it paid off, right? It paid off because you did a lot of things right. You we were seeing products that could have been a lot better. They didn't really stand out. You said my product's already better. I know that. So I'm going to make it look like it stands out even more, you know, and that's right. what paid off. So you, there was this consistency key. There was like finding a niche in the market, if you will, to just be more kind of proactive and proactive in what things look like. And then there's this element of growth. So what kind of walk me through what happened after that time frame? Because obviously we have we have Retro Supply Co, the website, and what you're describing right now is is being on creative market. So how long did that last before you said, Man, I've got to really scale this this up? So 
walk me through that. Yeah, um, that's a good question. And that really, um, looking back, made a huge difference in whether I'm working at Costco or something like that today or running Metro Supply. Um, because I had been working for those 18 months in uh, largely learning marketing, literally, it must have been 48 hours after my sales really blew up that one day that I had made a, a MailChimp landing page to bring people to a newsletter. So I didn't even have a site yet. Mm. But I knew like for sure that like if I wanted to have more control over these sales, I knew that a newsletter and email was the way to do it. So right. I, set up a, I, I set up a MailChimp newsletter. I didn't have a site yet, didn't have anything else. And um, I just started emailing every single person that purchased. I mean, I was I was on it, man. Like I get a notification of a sale. I would immediately go whatever I was doing. You know, like I felt like this is my chance. I'm not going to squander this. So anytime a sale came in and I saw it, I would immediately go to my computer. I would write them a thank you letter, um, give them a free gift. Uh, oh, I, what I said is I said, hey, if you go sign up for my newsletter, um, I have like a free gift of like some resources for you. Got it. Yeah. And, okay. and, that, and that grew it quite quickly. And I started getting featured a lot, especially in the beginning. I was being featured 80% of the time weeks. The newsletter came out for maybe six months on creative market, maybe a year. So I was getting a tremendous amount of traffic and I just knew I needed to get that to my own email list right away. Um, and so that's just manually putting that that labor in on every single customer in the beginning. And so when was that an easy process to take and kind of import into the site that you have now? Or did you have to do it all again when you kind of moved things to your own you know, Shopify website where you sell your products? Was it easy to kind of move those customers over and it wasn't like a weird transition or whatever, or did you have to like start collecting again, right? You had to start collecting emails again once you had the Shopify up and running. Cause I mean, creative market and Shopify to my knowledge, don't talk to each other, but if you're collecting emails somewhere else, I mean, you have the ability to do with them what you will. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think I, at first I was leveraging, um, MailChimp and then what I would do is when I would release a product, as, as you know, these kind of things can start to create feedback loops. So, once right. I start getting the newsletter going, then when I release a product on Creative Market, I can send it to my newsletter, send them to the Creative Market page. Then I get a bunch of buyers and I get a bunch of reviews and I get a bunch of comments. And then I was in the Bay Area and Creative Market was in San Francisco. So I'd actually would go down there sometimes and they, you know, toured their offices to me. I got to meet oh, okay. um, Aaron, the CEO, Zach, the marketing um, executive, who now I believe is the CEO of Dribble. So I'm going to talk to these these folks a little bit and get an idea of what's going on. Um, that would all that traffic that I was sending back to Creative Market would then make Creative Market look at the traffic and say we should feature this person right. again. Then they would feature me, and that would bring even more traffic, and that would make that feedback loop where then I'm writing to these new people and telling them, hey, you know, check out my email list, and I'm being really responsive and helping them. Um, and then they're giving me feedback on what they want, what's missing, what they wish someone would make. And then slowly I started building out Shopify was fairly new back then. Um, I built out a Shopify site. I literally came up with the name of the business in like five minutes. I just knew to back up to the beginning, it's one of the biggest things that was a fundamental change. I think that made things successful was that the embarrassment or fear of not looking like a good provider for my daughter, for my mm -hmm. wife became far more painful than putting things out and and having other designers say, that looks amateur, or you didn't kern that right, or the tracking's dumb on that, or what do, what do you think you're doing setting up Photoshop temp? You don't even know what you're doing, man. I was afraid of all that. And at this point, I just was like, I don't care. All that matters to me is that things get out, that I am just always releasing something that I'm messaging everyone. It just became, my only job is to be consistent. My only job is to be consistent and deliver these things. Mm. And I don't care about being embarrassed by these people. I care about what my daughter is going to think about me in 10 years. So I think that change in what mattered in terms of emotionally feeling embarrassed or scared of failure, um, like really fundamentally changed things. And one thing we didn't maybe talk about the, the last time we were talking was why or where you decided to go this vintage route. Um, you know, that's that's definitely my that's my alley. I love I love all things vintage and retro. Tobias, our founder, loves all thing, you know, vintage and retro. I mean, we still have heritage type. That's how we got started. So obviously we're we're no strangers to that. But you know, there there was that just a style that you personally loved? Was it a style that you were personally good at? Was it just you 
looking at the market and saying, hmm, there's no like cartoon uh, comic book brushes, so I'll make some, or there's no 50s esque style, whatever, or, you know, because we, and we can talk about that in a minute and how passion comes into play and how success and passion are closely related. But I would find it hard to believe that it was just you going full into a niche just because there was a gap. I feel like there's some sort of love here that you have for this design style. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because this could have been anything. But I think that meeting this need of the, which fits the name, retro supply and everything underneath that kind of fits that aesthetic. Where did that come from? Like walk us through that. Well, I, I was born in the in the 80s. So I'm a child. I have nostalgic memories of the 80s and 90s, uh, you know, the Smurfs, He-Man, all sorts of things like that. But I also was oh, yeah. um, largely raised by my grandmother when my parents were at work. And my grandmother's house was filled with mid-century stuff. So um, they had actually inherited um, a home from my great aunt. And one of the stipulations was that they don't change anything in the house. Wow. So when I moved to the Bay Area... We moved back there partially because of the startup and partially because my grandfather just passed away. My my grandmother had um, early signs of dementia and she okay. didn't want to leave her house. So we were helping her at her house. Well, this was like a flood of memories for me going back there. And so I'm seeing- And how, you know, and how old were you at this time? That you, that was, you're saying? Oh gosh, probably 28. Okay. Okay. So I, sorry. Yeah. I was just trying to, I, I'm not, I wasn't sure if you were talking about memories from like 16, 17, 18 or, or. Relative. No, I had memories from her raising me and then we came okay. back there, right? Yeah, so okay. then we came back to California. I live in Washington state now. We had went back to California to, to help her. And honestly, it was helping us. Like, like I said, like we were in debt. Like, so it was a way where we were able to go back oh, there right. and someone from the family needed to go back. And also it was just, it was beneficial to us in that way too. And I, my grandma is my, my favorite person in the world. So right. um, there was all sorts of benefits, but I was surrounded um, by all, you know, old candy land boxes and old oh, advertisements. My my man. grandfather was a, a produce manager at a grocery store for 30 years. So there'd be old name tags and packaging. And and I loved, I always loved retro design. You know what? Retro design never goes out of style. You know, now never. it might be it might be Y2K or it might be this or that, but it's always around. And so um I was largely just making things that I loved. I, I mm. loved all the mid-century stuff basically from the fifties through the eighties. That's right. So like the first pack, I just gathered up some of my favorite packaging from my grandmother's garage. It was all these things I loved, um, old soap boxes, um, all sorts of stuff. And I just scanned that in. I even went to at first Kinko's, like I went to Kinko's and literally paid them to use their scanners because I didn't have a wow. scanner. So yeah, I was desperate. I was doing whatever I needed to do, but that that's why I, I love that stuff. And so I was really just following what I loved. And it was, it was trendy too. You know, like I remember seeing Dustin Wallace, who's a great designer for fossil. Um, I really loved his stuff, um, amongst tons of other people. And, and, and what was that first pack that you're saying that you, was it just a bunch of like articles, like scanned graphics or was it, was it textures or what, what was that first like product or that first pack? Yeah, it was all the textures that I was using in the work for where I had worked in the past. And the pack was actually called Retro Supply. So the the, the name oh. came from that it was originally I made a pack called Retro Supply. Then I made another pack called Retro Supply 2. And then I was like, what's a super obvious business name that will give people a hint at to what we're offering? And I was like, well, that's really simple. And I made a lot of decisions for that point too. Something I'd learned from... Um, from Jonathan and from being the band and just, I've been watching a lot of people really carefully to see what was making them successful. And something I noticed was they were very good at implementing no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, so like when I was in a band with a guy who finally got, I was in a band and <clears throat> the leader of the band was the first leader of a band I'd been in where we were releasing albums, we were doing shows. I'd never had it happen so consistently. And he, he ran a very successful design business. And mm -hmm. I just remember him being like, we're putting out an album and he'd be like, well, we're putting it out. And, uh, He'd be like, well, we don't have this budget, so uh, we're just going to record it in the garage. Right. But just like that, we're going to do it? What if it's not good enough? Well, we'll just do it. Well, we need to now go mix it and master it and do all this stuff. Well, how are we going to do that? We'll just put it on a credit card. We're just going to do it. Like this, mm. It's coming out. It's happening. And so I knew from that and from seeing a couple of people that I modeled my behavior after that things just had to come out. So I remember that being a big thing I learned. People didn't do things perfect around me. The people that succeeded always just put the things out. It didn't matter. My future experience of I've you know taught some courses and done some talks and worked in workshops. And I'm sure you've noticed this. The people that succeed are not never the most talented people. 
Mm. Um, they're always the people that just execute. Like you look, I I looked at all your different profiles, right? The stuff you're doing, um, personally and, you know, as work and you just execute over and over like clock. Yeah. It's it's just consistency. Yeah. Right. And and I'm, and you're fantastic, but I think you probably have gotten fantastic. I'd assume because you put in the reps, you just keep doing things (laughs) consistent with it and you've gotten great, you know? Um, yeah. And And I would say that's, that, that's definitely, that's definitely a, a point of, you know, contention for maybe a lot of people is this, this get rich quick scheme is not your story, I would say. Now, you had a lot of income in a short amount of time, and a lot of success due to the work that you were doing. Man, that was that was grinding. That was years of figuring out what you like learning under this, this mentor that you had that was, you know, doing this other design stuff and giving him your best hours of the day and also trying to find how to merge your passion and this business idea, which maybe we can talk about together. And so that's what a lot of people may get frustrated or stuck with is this mindset of like, well, why isn't it happening for me? And I think the key takeaway is here, you haven't put the reps in yet. I mean, we say this all the time, like weekly, my brother and I teach marching percussion. That's what we do we're both professional percussionists. And so oh, that's, I didn't know that. and that, that's when we tell, we tell the kids, you know, they get frustrated because they, they mess up and they, they're not very good. And we're like, yeah, cause you haven't, you haven't practiced enough. You haven't done it enough, you know? And sometimes they'll be like, why can you guys play whatever? And it's like, well, cause we've been doing it for years, man. We sucked too. When we first started right. really bad, like very bad, lots of failure. And so, but you put the reps in that when you said reps, it just immediately, you know, that's what we call everything in the, in the marching band world is like, nope, we're getting another rep in like today in an hour and a half, I'll be on the floor with them and we'll be constant reps because we're preparing for a competition on Saturday. And it's because we need to put the reps in. Otherwise, we're going to go out and embarrass ourselves to a degree. That's actually OK to bring back another point that you said, whether or not you feel like, you know, your stuff is good enough or someone's going to criticize you. Well, then let's take that a step back too, and if I take the kids out on Saturday to perform, well, at least we did it. If we crash and burn, we're going to crash and burn together. And it's a learning experience, right? So if you put out a product and a hundred people love it and five people criticize it, what does it matter? You know what I mean? You, you did the, you did the thing, or maybe you put out a product and it, and the feedback is actually quite bad. You know, this is like, it's not what I was looking for. I want my money back. Okay. Well, what are you going to do? You're just going to go hide or are you going to take that feedback and make it a better product? You know what I mean? I kind of want to know what your thoughts are and, and system for growth here is because you had to transition into a lot of different things. And I know we're kind of turning turning from the like style into more businessy stuff, but I want to I want to attach those two things. So like all of the design stuff that's in this retro stuff, you're putting in the re- reps to, to get good at this style. You're also putting in the reps to get good at business and or being consistent. Where did you start to like branch out into like procreate brushes and Photoshop brushes and illustrate? Because you just said you had done some packs that were like textures or packaging or, you know, reference packs or inspiration, whatever. Where did you say, okay, I need to start making a change here or I need to like figure out how to make this product for procreate or I need to be able to make this? A, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I feel like for me, especially, I, I'm will also get frustrated because sometimes I don't even know what I'm supposed to to make for, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so then somebody just ends up with clip art and clip art's fine, but then it's not really as effective as like a brush that you can plug in. So this may be a little bit more technical, but where did that come into play for you? And like, I'm going to start developing these other products because now you have all these other skills you have to learn, I think, you know, yeah, no, for you no, as, sure. a, as a product designer, you had all these other skills you had to learn. Yeah. When you say all these other skills, are you referring to like uh, making brushes for different software? Yeah. Like you... the, the tools. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it started, you know, it, it's like it, it kind of very incrementally evolved. So it started with Photoshop stamp brushes and scan okay. textures. And then you really start. I, I kind of joke around with people sometimes that um I n- I never thought I would be I never thought I was going to make a living buy a house pay for employees do these things by selling Photoshop brushes um, or <laughs> we sell Photoshop actions all these things right I never thought that I'd seen these I didn't think it sounded fun to make things mm-hmm. like actions and things like that doesn't sound like it is <laughs> <laughs> right it doesn't it doesn't and so 
when I started, like, yeah, I was interested in those effects and stuff, but I really was also like working with what I had, right? There's a very low barrier to entry to make Photoshop brushes or textures, and I didn't have any money. But I always joke because I say things that feel not fun become infinitely more interesting and fun when you start making a good amount of money off them. This is um, true. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> right. So all of a sudden, right, Photoshop brushes, Illustrator graphic style, Illustrator brushes, these become fascinating. I'm looking at everybody's products that they're making. I'm looking at the people that are also making fantastic stuff. I'm, um, you know, looking at how they make them, looking at how they're marketing them, looking at how they're presenting them. Pretty soon it's, it's like you're, you know, you're in water and you don't know it kind of almost like you're so aware of it. When I was really into it, like really digging deep into it, you'd start to be able to kind of forecast trends like two years in advance. Like hmm. as I'm sure like you felt that too, right? Like you'll see things in the design community and um, two years later it starts popping up in Target. You know what I mean? Oh, but sure. You, but, but you saw it coming because you just did oh, the yeah. licensing and all that stuff takes forever for Target to actually get it onto the onto the floor. That's right. So I was just, you know, like for a while I started making these smart PSD templates, I called them, because those were starting to sell. And so I was following what was selling, what was trending. Um, I think another thing that's important is a lot of people make things for themselves, which is great. Mm. Um, but the amount that you make things that other people want will dictate how successful financially it is. So if you want to make things for yourself, that's fine. Just realize that you will not be as financially successful unless by chance it overlaps with what the market wants. Yeah. Um, okay. I think there, okay. I think there's an interesting point here that we can discuss because I can, I, I internally conflict with that a little bit as well, because this is where passion comes back in. Okay. We just said it a minute ago, like the passion plus the, the business, right. Makes the success. And this is something that we teach in POD a lot as well, is if you just make stuff for yourself, then that's probably not what other people are going to purchase in the print on demand world because you need to look at what's trending or what's coming up or what's what's selling. But then that will directly conflict with the creator's innate desire to create for themselves. So what I think is important about this distinction here is, yes, if you want to create stuff for yourself, that's fine. But I would almost just tweak it a little bit and say, you just need to be a master at what you're creating. So for example, if it's the style, so if we're talking about the retro style, you could sit there all day and just make retro illustrations that you love and you desire, and you could sell them as clip art and packs or whatever. But what's going to sell better is a procreate brush that is a fountain nib that you found in an antique shop that someone can draw with, right? That you may also use too to help you with your thumbnails or help you with your other stuff. And so you're like a master, if you will, at that niche. And so I want to get what your thoughts are about that because I agree with you. I agree that, but I also disagree in so much is or so much that if you're a master at the style and you create absolutely banger stuff, people will mm -hmm. want it. Do you see like the yes. the slight rub here? Yes, no, no, you make a really great point. And these are of course, just my opinion. I, people they make examples totally disproving what I'm saying every day. <laughs> I mean, a, a, great, a great example is Aaron Draplin, right? Um, oh, sure. I don't think there's any question Aaron Draplin is just doing what he loves. He loves all this stuff, it's he makes true. it. It does probably match with things that have that have trended. And the reason he loves it is because it's part of pop culture. But and then that fed into the fact that he made such great stuff that then that makes it even more people love it. Well, he's got right. a whole he, he he's he's got a whole vibe, man. It's like when when you when you buy something, you buy him. You know what I mean? It's like, right. He's got a personality. His book is amazing. His style is amazing. And that's what he loves. But but I would also directly compare that to you. I think you are that style. And it's clear that you have mastery over this style or the people that you get to help and work for you have mastery over this style. And right. so the products that you put out reflect that mastery. And that's what's that's where the sales come. Yeah. You know, I think so. Anyway, go, go no, I, think, I think you're right. I, I, so maybe I'd make first of all, I'd say you're 100 percent right. Like, I think you can get into something and it can be very distinct and something you love. And you're right. It'll it'll show you'll be able to educate people or. They will get passionate about it because they'll see the world you opened up for them. You know, like my kids do that all the time, right? They'll show me a, a new book or a video game. And mm. I would have never looked at it, right? Um, sure. Toka Life. My daughter loves Toka Life. Okay. I, I'm not, I'm not going to consume Toka Life. When I see it, I'm like, that's not my thing. But then you start realizing that people are creating stories around it. They're building things around it. 
And as she has passion for it, and I'm not spending all my nice and toka life, of course, but like I can like watch it with her and be like, I get it, you know? Um, so, sure. yeah. so you're right. Like, I think if someone has passion, it transfers. But here's like maybe an example from my shop where this may be the rubber hits the road. My children are, are half Mexican. I love Mexican culture. I love all that stuff. We made a Lotteria pack, those kind of cards for this, this Mexican card game. Um, there's a very distinctive kind of art used in that. And I love it. It it felt to me as I made it, I was like, this is cool because I love it. Like, I feel like it's kind of part of my children's background. It's part of my wife's background. I would love to make something with this. So I collaborated with um, Brad Woodard from Brave the Woods and we made a pack of oh, nice. incredible brushes that emulate this style perfectly. Well, Lotteria cards are not some magical style. They're watercolor done a little bit, you know, drier than some kinds of watercolor styles. Well, we could have packaged it as watercolors, but we really wanted to go for that. So when we released it, the sales were very lackluster compared to other products. Right. Why? Right. Because there's just not a strong, firm market for Lotteria paintbrushes. Right. Um, you know what I mean? People look at it and they ask themselves, and I know this from, from doing little surveys on our site, they ask themselves, I just don't know where I'd use it. It looks cool, but I don't know where I'd use it. Good Whereas point. If, if you're to say, here's retro watercolor brushes, that's much broader. Sure easier to sell. So um, in that case, I decided that I wanted to more, I was more passionate about making this particular set and I had to, it cost me sales and that's okay. Yeah. It was neat. Well, and I think, I think a healthy balance of both, maybe with a, a, a more healthier dose of what people are going to want to buy is important. And uh, being able to still express the, the passion and the desire to have amazing artistic products or designs or stuff in the niche is is kind of the driving north star of the products that you make whether or not you enjoyed making the product or not <laughs> i guess is part yeah. of that like well i'm gonna make this product was for me you know and if it did well that's fantastic if it didn't well it was still for me and it'll be there forever in case it ever does become a trend maybe it will i don't know you know something like it's it, who knows you know it could search results for that type of watercolor could come up at some point and it could blow up and it'd be like, Oh, well you can get them right here. Yeah. I think, I think a healthy dose of both, obviously more emphasis on doing research, which I'm sure over the past couple of years, you've been engrossed in more of the researching and surveying side, because I know another thing that I know you're really passionate about is building audience and asking them what they want. So then mm -hmm. you have the exact answer. Then you don't have to really guess anymore. And and you can also align all of their answers with your with your desires and be like, oh, that's sick. I'm going to make that first or I'm going to make this second or whatever. My question on that is how do you go about nurturing or growing this community um, that that loves this stuff, that desires this stuff, you know, through your email list or or your socials are also amazing. Like, how do you think about that? And and where where does maybe like relying on your current user base versus just searching online what your next product should be like where do those kind of hit and which one do you rely more on mm, that's a good question and and thanks for thanks for saying the socials are awesome we we try really hard to make them awesome you are make incredible uh social content um so, <laughs> so i appreciate you saying that it's 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 a, a huge compliment to have you even uh think they're good so thank you um we um we do do i'm, I'm really fascinated by mark i think equally fascinated by marketing and um sales and the research behind that especially like the psych psychological research i type of person that buys Malcolm Gladwell books and, mm, okay. um, you know, books like uh, Influence and things like that. Right. Um, so one thing that we did early on, because I came from a weird hybrid of loving marketing so much, was there's a book by um, a gentleman named Jeff Walker. It's, it's a little old school now, but it's called um, The Product Launch Formula. You can get it on Kindle or buy the book. It's I think it's like less than 20 bucks. He had a, his product launch formula. Essentially what it does is you find a community and then you start asking them once you kind of, you understand this community and you're part of it. And ideally you are participating in it and you care about this stuff too. You ask people what they want. So something that we did quite a bit um, earlier on was we'd send an email on something we suspected people really wanted. Okay. For instance, um, I'll tell a story of an example of one. Uh, um, and when you say that, 
you, you mean like a product that doesn't exist yet or you're just putting out a feeler for like a topic? Product uh, that doesn't exist yet. It doesn't exist yet. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it kind of, ex it, we've started working on it. We're confident enough that we started making it, but we're not finished with it and we get okay. participation from them. So um, let's say we make a, we made a pack called um, Color Lab, which is essentially like. Yes. A fantastic. PMY, yes. Yeah. Four, four color overlays of half tones and uh, four color process printing. And when we were making it, we, we knew we wanted to make it. We knew people needed it. It's hard to get that effect. There's really not a way to do it without some piece of software or with brushes or without a lot of Photoshop magic. And if you're in Procreate, good luck. Boy, um, they have a oh, filter, yeah. but it's not going to make it look like print. We had started working on this. And then what we do is we'd send an email out to our audience and we say, hey, here's what we're making. We're making this pack. Mm. Um, it's going to simulate four color process printing. What? We have just like two or yeah, two simple questions for you. And the first one was, what are the two things that a product like this must have? For okay. You to okay. So they're going to, they're going to actually respond in some form or some, some, they're going to actually give you like text information. Like you are asking them open-ended question. Like what are the two things? Or was it like a survey, like a drop down and they just select from. No, no. We were sending this to like type form with like an oh, open, okay, text, yeah, open yeah. text. Okay, like, yeah. So, so they could write whatever they want. We'd be like, tell us the two things. And then the second question would kind of vary. Sometimes it would be, is there anything else we should know? Very open-ended. Okay, um, yeah. And that's where this email list thing becomes really valuable, right? So we very often would get uh, between 500 and 1,000 responses to these. Wow, that's great. Yeah. And so once you get that, now we have things like ChatGPT that can read through them really fast and give you synopsis of them. But I would just literally print these out or look on the computer and then I'd write out on a piece of paper topics. And then each time someone would say something, you I would a mark, yep. a little mark next to it. And then I'd tally. start writing phrases that happen most often. And what happens is you end up getting like, uh, you know, that classic 80-20 thing where 80% of the people are mentioning 20% of the things. Um, well, they're going to have to be different shades. Um, they're going to have to be seamless. Maybe they say they, it has to have really great video instructions and written instructions, right? They'll say Very these important. different things. And so what you do is you're build you're building this out. And then when you release it, you have fantastic copy. Cause what you do is you just quote what exactly what they saying. said. Yeah, that's perfect. And you put it in the order of things they said was most important. So then you're essentially like listening to what they have to say and you're just repeating back to them what they want. And you've, of course, done an excellent job, the best you can do at, at getting them what they want. But when you do that, they feel like they were participating. There's some anticipation built. Mm -hmm. And then you're telling them what they wanted in the pack back to them. And that, again, that's Jeff Walker, Profit Launch Formula. I recommend it to anyone getting into digital products. Um, I've seen that make launches that I do 500% better because of that. I mean, it's just insane. Um, and it eliminates some anxiety. I'm sort of a, you know, overthinker. So having people tell me what they want gives me a little bit of confidence that we're going in the right direction because things like Color Lab, we'd spend over a hundred hours of labor. Oh gosh. Yeah. On making, I mean, huge amounts, right? And then we're porting it to Procreate, Photoshop, Illustrator, Affinity, Clip Studio Paint. That took a long time. And I have employees working for me doing that. And it's a huge amount of labor. So when you launch, you want to be pretty confident that you, that you know what customers want. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that sounds like very mini masterclass in marketing that you just shared, which is excellent. So I hope everybody watching uh, is taking that to heart and the, the influence. And of course, we we do we try to do a lot of the same thing with Kittle, you know, with these surveys, getting as many people to provide as rich content as available that they want to see. And obviously, you know, having things like a feature request board that they can go. So I would 100% agree with you and anybody also trying to grow their, you know, Etsy or their creative market or their Shopify or their whatever. If you haven't thought about that in a while, you know, I think that's definitely worth investigating is reaching out to your current captive audience and saying, what do you want? Or this is coming. What does it need to have? Or what would make you use this? Or what will you use this for? Or any and an or so that's 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 really really great that, now, actually, that leads to a question i kind of have for you about this so I, I do this sending people to type forms largely you're a master of social media and i i have <laughs> tried <laughs> well you're fantastic I, I definitely look up to you what you're doing in it um i might like put an instagram post up and give mm. a hint at what something is and then say in the comments tell us the same thing tell us the two things it must have but i'm curious what do you think is the best way if if you wanted to do it 
through social? Because I feel like a lot of people have big social followings, but maybe not an email list. That's true. Myself included. That? Myself included. I, I, was, I remember you berated me last time <laughs> that we, uh, that I still need to get set up. But you yeah, I, I, I would say I would say for one thing that really helps us on on social. And again, there's other people helping the the social media for for Kittle. It's it's not usually me. But one thing that we find success with is definitely uh, story surveys because they're a lot easier and they're not stressful. So I guess the way I express that or would explain it is they are not captive to feeling like they need to watch an entire post or stop scrolling because when you click the story you're prepared for what a story is i don't know how else to say it like when mm -hmm. you go to reels yes that you're gonna see some of these reels that are like or tiktok whatever you're gonna see some of this stuff where it's like you know very quick caption and then it's like you know read the caption for more or whatever i almost never do that like unless it's an exceptional like piece of camera gear that I just have to know, which is very rare because I'll just at that point, I'll just go YouTube it because I want to watch a full I don't want to read a caption I want to watch a full thing. So my expectation for watching a, a TikTok or a reel is such that I will continue to scroll and or be entertained or educated and I don't really have to leave. But in stories, I'm going to go to stories to engage. I'm personally, and I don't know what this, I'm not even talking about Kittle anymore, really. I'm personally more ready to engage and or respond to a story than, mm -hmm. than even commenting on some of my friends' posts. And for some reason, it feels like a lot of work for me to hit the comment button on a post as opposed to just clicking into the respond. Because in the story, it says respond, craft a response here. And it just immediately goes. I don't have to do anything. It doesn't take me anywhere else. I just reply, right. write the story and I can keep swiping. And so we point. found, I know I personally have found great success in my personal Instagram for stories. You know, I'll put out these, I do a lot of tattoo designs. And so I'll put out, what do you want to see next? Pokemon, Mario. Some of that is, I know that's going to do well because everybody has an opinion. Right. So I know that they're going to want to see Pokemon over Zelda or Zelda over Pokemon. Right. And I know that that's going to get attention. People can't help but respond. And that gives us the data. I, I'm assuming that it can. There are ways to do this within the you know platform, within reels, within posts. We've started doing the DM structure where you can comment a word and it'll DM you. We've started doing that and found some success there because it instantly gives someone to their inbox and so they feel like they're involved because they saw something that they liked. They went to the comments, they put in a comment, boom, they get the instant DM to whatever it is that they're wanting. So you're talking about with like an automated um, thing that yep. responds. Yeah, it's an automated. So if like we did one where we were talking about tips for growing your freelance business and it said comment freelance if you want these five tips and it sends you to a YouTube video I did that talks to the five biggest mistakes that freelancers will make and basically what you need to avoid. And so, so they would get the, they would get some content, just some quick little words. They'd also get a discount code to to Kittle for taking the time to comment and taking the time to go and watch the video, they'll get a discount code to sign up for Kittle, which everyone watching, feel free to go comment freelance on that video and get the discount code <laughs> um, and or in the story. So like I'm saying in the story, people's expectations, and hopefully this is helpful to viewers. I hope it is just, you got to think about what people are, are ready for when they go to see a story, they're ready to engage with the mundane or very quick and instantaneous action versus in a reel if it's very entertaining or funny i'll most likely watch all the way through probably won't comment because i don't care or and or a post like if it's something absolutely beautiful stunning of branding work my friend did most of the time i will go say oh my gosh this is such fire on the comment but that's very different than if he had said like rate my what i should work on next yeah i, I wish he would have just done it in a story you know like just just put it in a story. What kind of branding project do you want to see me new, do next? Whiskey label, candle label. Mm -hmm. I'm so much faster to click that in the story versus going and commenting and going and swiping through an A, B, C. Like what? I don't, it's too much work. And and that's just for me. And right. I feel like I have a pretty good attention span. That that just goes less and less and less, perhaps the, you know, the different audiences that you have, people's attention spans on social media. So that's kind of one way I would think about it. And hopefully that's helpful to all of our viewers in how you can get data through social media 
I, I do think the the DM comment structure is is actually quite nice. That's available to a lot of people now. I think it's just a quick setup of a tool that in integrates with Instagram or Facebook or something, and it'll it does it for you. Yeah, that's that's interesting. It sounds like how you're talking about it is almost like there's there's filtered levels of involvement and commitment. From the yeah, person commitment, watching. that was the word that I was looking for. That's right. And you really have to consider when you're doing something, what's my goal and how much commitment do I need to decide where you want to do it? Yeah, because polls are always good. Um, and it's it's less obtrusive and it's less responsibility than asking an open-ended question that someone really has to reply in a comment and think about, which is perfect for an email response and that's why you get the dedicated users from an email response that will go to that type form and fill it out versus an audience that may not even know you yet that's getting served your reel or whatever and you're now you're asking them to comment something and they're like well i don't know why i would comment on it because i don't even know what you do yet <laughs> right. so right so that's the responsibility of having to comment is a lot versus just tapping procreate, you know, comic book brush or whatever, whatever the, what, as much of you can just provide to them. And I do wish that social media, I wish that Instagram had a lot more robust version of polls. I wish it could do a lot more. Now Facebook's is quite good because you can just keep adding, you can keep adding stuff to the polls and you can even at like leave it open ended. People can type in their own thing on the poll and so then they can take as much responsibility as they want. So Facebook has that figured out. That's kind of how I think about it. What you said about commitment and responsibility is is important when trying to get feedback on social media. That's really helpful. <laughs> Hopefully that's helpful to other people watching that, you know, may have growing their their channels and they're selling stuff and they're like, why can't I get anybody to respond on my on my thing? Well, have you tried being social on social media as opposed to trying to run your account like an ad because your account is not an ad. An ad shows up in a different way for a different reason. Trying to bring the social aspect back into social media could could prove helpful. So I think one one last question as we land the plane here for you is just what what can we expect like from from you? I mean I know hopefully we're gonna see more YouTube stuff coming from you, which I, of course I'm going to link down below. Obviously people can't use procreate brushes in Kittle, but they can use fonts and the other assets and textures and things that you sell. So if anybody wants to check all that stuff out, that's easily up. You can upload that and integrate that in Kittle. So yeah, tell us like if there's any kind of sneak peek you have or just what's, what's coming out for you. Yeah, it's definitely a, it's definitely like a, t a big time of transition. I think, you know, when, when I got into it, um, when I made Retro Supply 12 years ago, the market was very largely empty. I don't think it was really, uh, it was not nearly as busy. And I think there was not, these days it's become a lot more um, cool, for lack of a better word, to put design resources out. There was a period where it was kind of like you were in this weird gray area if you were the person doing that. And now you're getting a lot of just uh, fantastic, you know, well-known artists um, that are making things and, yeah. and putting them out. So it's it's a different market. And I think... I didn't get into it being some some big influential artist that did not uh, help help me. I don't know. I'm kind of exploring it. You know, my kids are all in in uh, grade school now. I want to spend more time with my kids. Mm. Um, I'm trying to find ways to scale the business in the sense that um, we've done a lot of different stuff. That's the things that I love. That um, the people that work for me love, and a very our core audience loves. But I yeah. would love to explore a wider range of things and mm. start partnering with people um, that are just amazing creators in their field and then find, we kind of talked about this before and you actually kind of sparked me on this is just what are some amazing things that other people are offering where you can partner with them and together you can add more value That's right. to, whatever, to what that thing might be, whether it be a course or a, a guide or brushes or whatever it is. Um, yeah. I love the idea of, of, of just combining forces with people. That's you spend time just interacting with them and having more relationships with people less time, you know, testing brushes quietly on your own. And, um, and it just provides like a unique value to people, I think. So um, I think that partnerships and people and relationships with customers and creators will be largely where we go. Well, if someone wants to know how, you know, best to either follow or keep updated 
what would be the way to do that? Should we, um, should people go straight to the Instagram? Should they sign up for the newsletter? What, what do you think is best for people to kind of stay up on thing that's happening for retro supply co? Yeah. If you, if you want to, um, if you want to hear about retro supply products or you just want to get inspiration for your own business, uh, if you want to grab fonts for you know, using in Kittle, things like that, um, just going to retro supply, you can go there and there's opt-in forms on the homepage, or I believe retro supply forward slash pages forward slash newsletter will take you to a page where you can opt in and you'll hear about updates. You'll hear, but you'll see these surveys come through where we ask for feedback from people. Um, you'll get discount, different things like that. Um, also I'm, just starting like a second, I had a couple of years ago done something called passive income for designers, um, mm. kind of teaching people about that. And I'm starting like a little newsletter that's kind of an extension on, into like a new era of that. So maybe I'll send you a link to that after this. Um, that sounds real. I, I think a lot of people would be very interested in because that's what a lot of what we teach too is is that's what a lot of people are looking for is passive income and how do we do that and what does that even mean and the word passive versus like the amount of work that you have to you know and so i think a lot of people would be interested in that i mean i look for podcasts like that all the time so well yeah i'm doing a little newsletter it's called i think it's gonna be called create and convert I'll, I'll give you a link to it if, you, if you're able to share it that'd be awesome um in the links below but yeah because you're right passive passive income i think is a very loaded term it's not really passive it's just <laughs> you're selling something repeatedly um Mm. You no, know, like Hershey bars are sold repeatedly, but no one calls that. I don't think anyone working at Hershey thinks of it as passive income. Um, cause you oh, do have wow. to good analogy. Yeah. Good analogy. Right? Yeah. Cause yeah. you have to keep creating stuff. You have to make updates. You have to work with customers. You have to do things. Um, but it can scale a lot easier than your time can. So anyways, yeah. Perfect. Well, everyone, please go check out those links. I've got the Instagram, the YouTube, the website, the newsletter. It's all down there. Of course, don't forget to subscribe to Kittle. If you have come with us on this journey all the way 57 minutes into this and you're not subscribed to Kittle's YouTube channel, I have no idea what you're doing right now. Please subscribe. It'll take you two seconds. It's a white or black button, I guess, depending on what your browser is set to. It was red. I don't know why it's not red anymore. They changed it. So please hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and comment what you think about this conversation. If there's something that didn't make sense, you can comment below and perhaps I'll have Dustin back on the channel. We'll dive into it. Okay. If there's something that you heard that didn't make sense or a topic that you want to dive into about growing an online business or just design in general, or you just want to see more retro stuff, I'm sure Dustin would be happy to provide that for you. So please comment down below so we can see that. Thank you all so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Bye.